Believe me or don't believe me, I don't care. My story is true, and that's all that matters. It was the summer of 2004. I was camping with my younger siblings and my parents. My father was always one for campfire stories after dark. He would tell us of creatures which lurk in the darkness, stalking you and pouncing when you least expect it. As a kid, I never believed his stories, but I sure as heck was afraid of them anyway. Every night on those camping trips, we would stay up late, roasting marshmallows and laughing. Dad would tell us kids scary stories of the woods and the monsters that watched us from the shadows. He would take a drink from his beer at the most intense moments just for the suspense. Mom would give him a dirty look and complain about his stories giving us nightmares and making us afraid to be alone. I would stick my nose in the air. Nonsense. I'm not afraid of some make-believe creatures in the dark, I said. My siblings would quickly agree and Dad would continue with the story. But when the time came to lay down in the camper, us kids would timidly pull the covers over our heads in fear. Fast forward to 2016. I was 20 years old. I took my wife, Penny, camping with my two kids, Roger and Kathy. When we arrived at the campground, I pitched the tent and sent Roger and Kathy to collect twigs and branches for the fire. Penny gave me an odd look. You said you used to go here with your parents 12 years ago, she questioned. I smiled and nodded. Yeah, every summer we would spend a week in these woods. Penny looked concerned and she grew silent. Did you ever, she hesitated, and did you ever stumble across anything weird? I gave her a puzzled stare. No, not at all. I said with a raised eyebrow. Why do you ask? Um, something seems off. Penny's voice was lowered, in case the kids were around. I feel like we're being watched. A cold shiver ran down my spine. I knew that Penny wouldn't lie to me like that. She was right, now that I thought about it. I realized that I had that same feeling in my gut. I glanced back into the surrounding forest, watching for the kids. Kathy, Roger, I called. Come on back, guys. After a moment, I heard the snapping of twigs and looked expectantly into the trees. A minute later, Kathy stepped into the clearing with a broad smile on her face. She proudly held up a handful of branches and set them next to the fire pit. Hey, good job, I praised her. But then I realized something. Kathy, where's your brother? She shrugged. Oh, he ran off to look for kindling, she explained. I haven't seen him. I felt a tingle up my spine as I realized it was growing dark. Roger, who was only 12, would never be able to find the way back to the camp on his own. Not if the woods were dark. I looked toward Penny, giving her an urgent stare. I'm going to go look for him. Call me if you need anything. Penny nodded and set Kathy on her lap and I made my way through the trees. Once I lost sight of the campsite, I started to get nervous. I hated being alone in the woods. My father's stories came back to me and I couldn't erase the concern on Penny's face from my mind. I walked, calling out Roger's name as the woods grew dark. After what felt like forever, the sun had finally set, and I could see the trees illuminated eerily by the moonlight. I froze and listened, a cold feeling creeping up my spine as I heard soft footsteps behind me. The footsteps fell silent when I stopped walking, and I waited for a minute, listening. I listened for a while, and then hesitantly continued my search. This time, I did not speak, I just listened, and then the footsteps started again. I continued walking, trying to pretend that I wasn't hearing it. The only thing clumsy enough to snap twigs when in the woods was a bear, or another person. I prayed it was nothing dangerous. The thought gave me chills. 
I felt an unpleasant feeling in my gut as I started to walk faster. My heart was pounding so hard that I wondered if whatever was stalking me could hear it. The footsteps intensified as the creature started following me at an alarming speed. I broke into a run and made a mad dash for the campsite. I whipped out my phone and I dialed my wife. Penny picked up. David, did you find him? I shouted into the phone. Get into the tent now. I heard Penny stifle the confused gasp and the tent zipper open. What's going on? She asked, sounding panicked. I'll be there in a minute. Stay as quiet as you can. I shoved the phone into my back pocket and burst into the clearing. I dove into the tent and pulled the zipper shut. My heart was pounding out of my chest and my hands were shaking. Whatever was chasing me began to sniff around the camp. It gave a low, guttural growl and nosed the side of the tent. As it began to retreat, I silently unzipped the tent window. I stifled a cry of pure horror and clapped my hands to my mouth. Every nerve in my body was screaming at me to run, to hide, but I couldn't move. The creature was a monster. It was huge with black fur covering its entire body except for its face. And oh boy, its face, it was a deer skull. The beast, it had something snagged onto its claws. It was a piece of Roger's coat, bloody and torn. I stared into those empty and horrible eyes. It hadn't seen me. Thank God, I whispered as it retreated into the trees. My father's stories came rushing back to me. A Wendigo. My wife grabbed my arm, causing me to jump out of my skin. What the heck was that? She demanded, visibly horrified. I met her gaze urgently. We have to go, we have to get out of here now, I said. But Penny looked stunned. What about Roger? Where is he? You didn't find him? I grabbed her hand. Penny, I'm sorry, but Roger's gone, I said. It's too late, there's no way. We have to go, we have to get out of here. Penny's eyes filled with tears and I ordered her and Kathy to get into the truck and to lock it. They got in and buckled it, and then I banged my head against the steering wheel and put the truck into drive. We didn't bother even packing up our sight. There was no time. But what happened next? I have a hard time recounting it. It will scar me for the rest of my life. As I pulled out of our campsite, I spotted that monster, that beast, whatever it was again, Wendigo. It stood just within the tree line, and in its claws, dangling almost mockingly, was Roger. Well, a part of Roger at least. It was the head of my son. Beside myself, I screamed and the truck swerved. There was a deafening crash as a tree came up out of nowhere to meet us and the world and everything around us went black. I woke up in a hospital. I don't know how long it had been. The doctor said that I had gotten into an accident, and that my wife and kids were all fine. But something was off about what he said. The doctor, he had said, kids, not just kid. Plural. I asked about my son and they said that he was found a day after the accident, perfectly healthy, but terrified out of his mind. Whatever had stalked me that night, it hadn't harmed him. The whole time, I mean, Roger had been fine. So whose head was it? Whose head had been in the monster's grasp? Whosever it was, I'm happy that everybody is safe.